Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, in this video, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, the idea of recovering our dialectical capacity, our organic dialectical capacity by sort of um, learning to get more regulated our basic arousal patterns. So the idea is that, you know, we're not going to flatline on arousal. That's, that's not human. That's not being alive. But just kind of taking the violence out of the, the spikes and the drops and the arousal patterns, just get it a little more, a little more even. Um, so it'll still go up and down, but just not violent up and down. Um, and the idea is that organically, I believe, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, and, and maybe I'll be wrong, but I'm hoping that, um, that if we can just, just have a more, um, just kind of a more even arousal pattern, basically, that, that our dialectical processes will organically come, you know, either improve or just come or come back. And, uh, and of course, with the added, the added uh, element that we do in some way have to allow dissonances to sort of sit on the table in front of us. Okay. Um, one of our behaviors, I believe that maybe is more for personality disorders than for addictions. Um, and maybe this is part of the addictive nature or, or the addictive analog that we experience in the personality disorders is that I think we have a tendency to sort of um, kind of dismiss and separate um, um, dis dissonant, um, dissonant parts of us or dissonant ideas. And so we just don't allow dissonances to sort of sit. We sort of dispose of them or we judge them or we assess them so quickly that we just don't have a lot of sitting time, just letting dissonances just kind of be there, you know? And so uh, the idea is that, you know, a combination of getting our arousal a little bit more, you know, just a little bit more regulated, just a little more kind of smoothed out. And then also just kind of learning slowly to have a little more dissonance just sort of sitting on the table that we will naturally develop more dialectic. The dialectic is just an organic process. It's just waiting to be given the, the, the environment to just naturally metabolize. Um, and I guess I'm even suspecting that, you know, allowing that dialectic may actually be healthy, not just for the actual brain, but just for the whole body, because it may be part of our metabolism, our whole metabolism that we be not not um, ignoring and leaving split um, you know dissonances to not be reconciled but that we actually be always metabolizing in reconciliation of, um, of dissonances you know and so that's kind of that's kind of um, counterintuitive because it would mean if, if we're really going to be living with dissonance you know it's just kind of a practice that may involve kind of a baseline of a little bit of irritation or a little bit of discomfort that maybe we wouldn't expect to be healthy. Okay. But I can say that I've tried this for just a little while, you know, I mean, I've had a few years kind of experimenting in between minimalism and just some other you know, kind of practices that are kind of bordering on, you know, trying to have more dissonance in my life. Uh, granted, you know, I, I work a lot. And so, um, I haven't really dedicated myself and I'm not really a, you know, like a psychology superstar or like super fanatical about psychology, but, um, but, you know, just in the time that I've, you know, I've had, or even just periods where I've had more dissonances just kind of allowed, you know, just to sit without being assessed or resolved. I can say that, you know, it's kind of like that habit of um, where you learn to take cold showers <laughs> um, or if you don't take cold showers, you take a hot shower, but then at the end of your hot shower, you, you make it cold at the very end, you know, just, it's like this counterintuitive thing where weirdly you actually end up weirdly feeling better, you know, or feeling more stable. It's kind of like weird. It's like, it's like the best medicine is sometimes not the most savory kind of juicy, tasty medicine. Sometimes it's just a little bit uncomfortable and then you may not realize you're happy, but you, you, you sort of notice after a few days, it's kind of like, wow, I'm actually more stable, you know? So uh, now granted, not, not pie in the sky. I mean, <laughs> I'm still an irritable person and, you know, you know, it's not like you're going to step into nirvana. I mean, you're still on planet earth and you're still, you know, dealing with the, the tribulations of being a mortal being. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's nothing that miraculous, but I think the difference is significant enough that it, it deserves attention. And, you know, at least I invite people, those who have an instinct that it might, might fit, you know, just to experiment with it, you know, everything from cold showers to just kind of, 
just not acting out a lot, whether mentally or physically, you know, just kind of letting things just be frustrating, not reacting or, you know, going in stages, like maybe postponing reactions by like 10 minutes, an hour, two hours, 10 hours a day, just learning how to postpone reaction, you know, just to kind of have more time holding the kind of, unre you know, seemingly unreconcilable dilemmas and just kind of letting the metabolism sort of process the stinking pile of dissonance, you know? And um, yeah, I mean, um, so in this video, I want to focus on something that I find to be almost like, uh, like a, a trope or like kind of a, a motif or a, a cliche in psychology, which is that it's very unhealthy to just sit there with a frustration without discharging a, an emotional reaction. This idea, I think, it, I don't know if it comes from Freud or, or from just, you know, psychotherapeutic folklore or just a subculture of, you know, the psychological subculture. But basically, basic, the idea is that, you know, if you're, if you're kind of steaming in a kind of frustration that is super unhealthy not to discharge your healthy anger or your get it out of you, you know, kind of like purge the, you know, purge the, purge the irritation kind of thing. Um, now there may be times where that is true. Okay. So I want to be, I want to put a big asterisk on this, but I also want to see if maybe we can get a little more, um, nuanced kind of parse the, the actual realities of frustration, because I think, um, in our world in cluster B, I hope that one of our focuses is on kind of learning to notice and moderate basically our arousal patterns. Okay. I firmly believe that cluster B basically is cluster B is basically a breakdown of dialectical processing as a result of arousal, uh, irregularity, you know, arousal severity, basically. So it's basically an arousal pattern, uh, phenomenon. Okay. And basically, whether it's uh, whether it's fully genetic or it's genetic and and um, and environmental or fully environmental, we end up in arousal patterns that basically cause a full breakdown, kind of a, a long term, kind of a, a long term breakdown, you know, um, a pervasive breakdown in our dialectical processing. Okay, so basically, um, my belief is that the dialectical processing is organic and doesn't need to be played with because you know I, I think. We should, I think we should be open to the idea that molestation, just like molestation applies to people touching your genitals or getting to your private parts. I think there are certain private parts of our soul that people shouldn't be fiddling with, even, even therapists, that, that it almost borders. Maybe in some future, we'll see, looking back, that there was, we were allowing a kind of a molestation, you know, where people are kind of getting in there and doing witchcraft in your private areas and kind of over-influencing things that should really be very private. So I'd like to believe that maybe the deepest part of our heart like say our dialectical processing, hopefully, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but you know, hopefully I'd like to believe that that's kind of a private area that, that nobody, not even a therapist should be fiddling, you know, and reaching inside your underpants and kind of touching. No, I think, um, I think it's, it's probably more appropriate, at least hoping, hoping, like I hope I'm right uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, my instinct is that we ought to, we ought to accept that there are some parts of us that can function darn well by themselves organically. And that even we don't have to fiddle with it, you know, kind of like the masturbatory side of it, you know, and that we, we don't even need to be molesting ourselves, you know, in those kind of very private, you know, really intimate areas that may, may just have their own organic processing. Like, you know, like, why would I want to go and like put a lot of drugs and maybe surgically interfere with my kidney? when my kidney can perfectly well function as long as I don't eat too much salt or I don't like uh, abuse it with too much uh, drugs or whatever, you know, if I just, if I'm healthy, I know my kidneys will work without me going and playing with my kidney. You know what I'm saying? So, kind of like that. So I'm thinking that the, uh, the uh, dialectical metabolic process is kind of like an organ and it functions just fine. If you don't have too chaotic and toxic an atmosphere, because I really do believe that very erratic arousal patterns are basically like a toxin. And so the idea is that it's not like we want a flat line. I mean, that's not healthy either, but we just want to get it into more normal levels. So we don't have literally a toxic uh, chaos inside our, our, you know, our delicate, um, you know, metabolic uh, uh, organism, you know? So, okay. So getting into this idea from psychology, this idea that, you know, it's unhealthy not to discharge emotion 
when you have frustration or provocation, that somehow you're sort of containing and suppressing and causing harm to yourself. Now, I, I think at some extreme, I think they may have a point. Okay. But I also think that in our world where we want to learn to put dissonances just on the table and just let them sit, I think there is some level of low grade frustration that we ought to just let it be without having a big flash discharge. Because why? If I'm going to have uh, flash discharges and be healthy, you know, in the eyes of some psychologists, you know, healthy, I'm expressing my healthy anger. I'm not letting it sit for even two seconds. I'm, I'm being, I'm liberating the feelings and I'm, I'm just being, you know, I'm, I'm serving myself by not letting things build up inside of me. Okay. On some level, I challenge that because I think that um, that will, I think, induce a little bit of that erratic arousal. Okay where um, maybe there's some level of frustration, not, not extreme, okay, but some moderate level of frustration, some baseline level of discomfort, uneasiness, having things just kind of sitting on the table that deserve to be reconciled, you know, damn it, damn it, um, you know, how can I not make an opinion about the Ukrainian war, you know, because shoot, these Ukrainians, you know, they have their sovereignty and blah, blah, yeah, don't tell me about, you know, Russia and, and the geopolitics and all this. And it's kind of like, okay, but hold on. It's like, yeah, that may seem so healthy to just discharge your feelings, but you know what? Um, and maybe, maybe Russia is a bad country. Okay. Maybe Russia, you know, whatever, but there is geopolitics. I'm sorry. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, I'm not saying Russia is a good country. I'm not saying Putin is a good person. He may be probably a terrible person. Okay. But sorry, but geopolitics is something. Okay. It is real. How would we feel in the United States if Russia and China started getting super influential into Mexico? Okay. And they could say we're evil because we don't want to let Mexico be free, but it's geopolitics, right? I mean, do you see the United States letting Mexico be like Cuba? You know, I mean, would we just stand there and let that happen? You know? Um, so it's like, okay, I'm not saying anybody's right, but the fact is, is that there are different sides to the argument. You know what I mean? And I'm not answering the question. I'm just saying, do we really want to have a flash reaction, you know, to something like the war in Ukraine? Yeah, okay, I'm, it's terrible. Also, how do, how much responsibility does the United States have for setting up Ukraine to start expecting things that maybe aren't realistic in the geopolitics? Okay, we set Ukraine up to start believing that they could count on certain unfolding of their history, and we were letting them be unrealistic in the face of their geopolitics. Okay, and, and, and I'm not answering the question. Okay. It may be in the end that all the people are right and that the, the Ukraine war is good and that, you know, they should be fighting the Russians. Okay, whatever. You know what? The point is not to come to a conclusion so fast. Okay. And yeah, some people say, but, it, you know, it's unhealthy just to hold it in, you know, and I want to have my flash of opinions and everything. Well, you know, the other option is that you can just sit there with all the different points of view, not assuming that any of them are perfect points of view. Okay. I don't have to say that Putin is a good person. I don't have to say that Russia is a good country. I don't have to say that the United States is a good country. I don't have to say that it's good or bad that Mexico would somehow theoretically become very friendly with Russia or China or how we would react or whether that would make the United States good or bad. It's not about whether these are good or bad. These are just real different points of view. These are real different uh, geopolitical considerations. And it's not just this thing of sovereignty and the ideal of a, of a free country having their own destiny. Yeah, that's one thing too. I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't discount that either. But it's just one of many, many factors, real, real, realistic factors. And so, basically, yeah, I agree. For all those people that are just all these pundits that have these flash opinions and taking sides, and it's a bad war, it's a good war. You know, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. Um, there's going to be nuclear war. We're going to, you know, okay. You know what? Like, I, I understand all those positions. Okay. And I understand the frustration and I understand it would might be unhealthy just to sit there with all these competing dissonant ideas and not have some flash reaction because I need to express myself. But, you know, maybe that's a perfect example, a perfect example of where we can just kind of sit there with the, ugh, the uncomfortableness, the, the tension and the people are dying. I mean, you know, so it's like a real it's a real thing. I mean, it's a real serious issue. And, it, and, and it's like. Um, do all these people have to die? I mean, that's also heavy. Did all those people have to die just because of some, you know, fantasy about, about autonomy and, and free countries and, you know, um, destiny, you know, 
I mean, you have to ask all these questions. You know, would it have been better to, to negotiate an early st- settlement? You know, did Boris Johnson have to go there and, and convince Zelensky not to make a deal with, with Russia or whatever? I mean, well, they, they hurt. It hurts to see all that, you know. And uh, but maybe I challenge, you know, that maybe it's maybe if it's not too too severe, you know, if we're not if we're not really like toxic toxic, you know, if it's just kind of like a moderate level of frustration, okay maybe some of us at least can sort of have that frustration without trying to make a quick decision because those are very complex competing factors you know and they don't deserve to be all dismissed these are a lot of different geopolitical and ideological factors that are all sitting on the table okay and maybe i don't have to make a quick quick calculation maybe i can sort of sit let them sit because maybe if i even give myself a week to just kind of think about it maybe in that week my metabolism my heart will metabolize something that I never expected as a possible, um, you know, more, more sophisticated or more, more mature um, way of, you know, way of seeing the possibilities, you know, and maybe even the politicians and the pundits, instead of giving their flash opinions, because so they can get paid a, a paycheck by Fox News or, or, you know, MSNBC or whatever to make their fast, fast, flashy, extreme ideological opinions. Maybe they could say, well, you know, um, they could tell, you know, Rachel Maddow, or whatever. It's like, hey, nice question. I mean, and, uh, you know, of course, I can see the part of the, you know, the sovereignty and all that. But, you know, we have to admit there are other factors on the table. It's, it's painful. You know, it's painful, but there are lots of factors. And so, you know, my inclination is maybe it's a just war. But, you know, the final in the final analysis, maybe we'll never know. Maybe we'll be proved wrong, you know, and maybe maybe a part of us should just kind of sit and sit on it for a week. Because if we just keep in our camps, just keep arguing, arguing our naive sides, we're never going to process maybe to a, a third way or a, another possibility that only we can only reach through letting it sit and letting it metabolize through the human heart, you know. And so uh, that's just one example, you know. But um, but basically the idea is that, um, you know, maybe a really extreme level of frustration maybe is not good to hold. Uh, for too long because maybe that would be toxic but maybe there is a level of low grade baseline frustration you know that maybe humans can sort of tolerate and it might even be good for us because it's just the amount of discomfort that allows the heart to do the processing that it's supposed to do you know and so i do challenge this idea that um, it's always unhealthy to hold irritations or you know frustrations. sometimes it's good to just let them sit you know can you imagine i mean um so many places in life, you know, um, the other thing too, this is so important, um, is, uh, the idea that there's like, um, like two stages of arousal irritation. Okay. And, um, basically I look at them as like the, the frustration provocation stage and then the reaction stage. Okay. So basically imagine if you're a gambling addict, you know, I, I, I was addicted to gambling. Um, and I'm, I'm embarrassed about it. I, 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 I can't, I can't, there's always a part of me that's embarrassed about that, but you know, there was a time when I, I was really in a bad place in my life, and uh, and I I got into gambling, and, um, and it was you know really embarrassing, um, and I try to think like what would it be like if I because I've had moments where you know I'll see like a, a documentary about Las Vegas or something, and it's like oh my god, wouldn't be would, would be kind of cool to just be able to maybe spend one day in Las Vegas, you know, I can almost imagine being inside the casinos and stuff like that. Um, and the same thing happens, I think, when people have porn addictions, you know, where, um, I, I don't know if I've been addicted to porn, but I've enjoyed porn in the past. And I, I think it didn't do good for me. I'll be honest. Like, I think just because of my personality disorder, I think it was actually really pretty, um, I don't think I even realized how bad it was to be quite honest. Um, I'm being honest about this. Like, I know a lot of people say, hey, but people should be free. Yeah, people should be free. I mean, you should be free to watch porn. I get that. You should be free to make porn if you want to make porn. You know, I I get that. But I I can't say that I think it's very healthy for me. I'll be honest. You know, I'm just being honest. Like, um, and I try to use those analogies, like the gambling, you know, the the porn, um, things like, uh, you know, making flash opinions about the war, about politics, you know. Can we really have a, an 80 year old, 82 year old person running for a second term? I mean, it's like, <laughs> sometimes I'm really tempted to make an opinion on that because it's like, sometimes it's like off the charts, but you know, things in the world, things that frustrate us, you know, things that, um, 
temptations, you know, just basic temptations. Like somebody's pissing me off. Somebody is being ridiculous. Like you're being ridiculous. You know, it, it doesn't deserve, you don't deserve to, to have your opinion uh, even five minutes because what you're saying is ridiculous. You know, sometimes you will run into ridiculous things. You know, a boss that tells you something is actually uh, inappropriate, you know, ridiculous. Do I just sit with that? You know, it's like, so there's no final answer to any of these things. But I think generally when we have personality disorders, if we're going to work on our regulation, I think we have to identify there's two stages to arousal. Okay. There's the provocation temptation uh, arousal, which is like a pre arousal. Okay. Like imagine, I'm sorry, imagine if you're addicted to porn, you know, imagine you are addicted to porn. Okay. And you have a weakness for that. Imagine you have a, a weakness for gambling. Okay. Imagine you have a weakness for methamphetamine. Okay. Or imagine you have a weakness for losing your temper and, uh, and letting people know how you really feel, you know, when you honestly believe what they're saying is ridiculous, you know, and deserves to be told, you know, imagine all these provocations. Okay. Imagine if somebody treats you like crap in a restaurant, you know, like crap, like, like they give you exactly what you didn't ask for. And then they don't take you seriously when you ask for your, you know, I wanted my hamburger without onions, or I wanted my bun to be toasted or whatever stupid thing. You know, and somebody's actually not respecting you. You know, how do you deal with that? Like, you know, you're going, going to be provoked. And so basically, um, you know, when I look at that, that's already an arousal. Like if you look at the arousal, you're not flatlining when you're being provoked. When you're provoked, you're actually starting to get aroused. OK, but what, what I think I've noticed is that in many, many cases, when we finally discharge our reaction, OK, and we go into full reaction, like, yes, I have an opinion about Ukraine, okay? There's a discharge that takes place. It's almost like a relief. Like, finally, I'm no longer holding all this crap. I'm making a decision. I think it's a good war. I think it's a bad war. I think we should have settled with Putin, okay? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and gamble. <laughs> oh, I feel so much better because now I'm just sitting at the table and I'm just playing my cards. Yeah, you do feel better. But the thing is, is that now your arousal has gone like this, okay? So like um, my my idea is that the, the pre-arousal, like the, oh my God, I would love to just watch one porn. You know, it's like, ah, it's been so long, you know, and, and it's like that pre-arousal that you're starting to get. But then once you actually go into it, zoom, you go off the charts. It's like you took your dose of methamphetamine, you took your, your heroin, whatever, you took your drug, you know, and then boom. And then it feels so good. And it's like, ah, this is heaven. This is heaven. I finally set my opinion. Now I got the burden off my shoulder. I, I Now I know how I feel about Ukraine. Now I'm sitting at the table playing my blackjack. Ah, I just won you know, $600. It's like, ah, it wasn't so bad. But the thing is, you don't realize you just, whoop, you just spiked your arousal, you know? And it's like, I believe that, you know, the pre-reaction the pre is still an arousal and it's very irritating, okay? And you would say, well, isn't that unstable? But it's not as spiky. It's not as extreme. And so I think we can actually, I believe we can learn through practice to tolerate the irritations and the frustrations and the provocations to a point, you know, again, we all have our limits, but we should allow a little more range of being provoked, being kind of irritated, being kind of uneasy. It's like, yeah, this needs to be decided on. Well, okay, let it go for two more hours, you know, let it go for two more hours. Let it go for six more hours, you know, make your decision. I'll make a decision tomorrow. I'll sleep on it. Yeah, but I don't want to sleep on it. Maybe it's like taking a cold shower. You know, there's some level of frustration where we don't have to always be discharging, okay? And our heart can take care of it. Our heart will metabolize a certain amount and it's not going to be toxic. You know what I mean? It'll actually be better for us because we'll have a better heart and it might actually kind of, it might kind of tune our body and our mind to actually be healthier, you know? So I just, I put it on the table. Like I'm not deciding it. I just put it on the table then maybe there is a grade, a level, a, a medium level of frustration, uneasiness, like a baseline uneasiness that maybe is actually more than okay. Maybe it's good for us. Maybe it actually stabilizes us. Maybe it makes our heart work more and do more. And it might, uh, might even help us physically, you know, because I believe that all metabolisms are all mind and body. Okay, I really believe that the, the mind, the idea that the mind and the body are like these separate things. I, I think we should not be so sure about that. I think um, there's a lot of metabolism that will take place in how we process just um, 
frustrations, you know, that does open a part of our metabolism that we want to be uh, functioning. You know, we want the kidneys to do their job. We want the liver to do its job. Maybe the dialectical process is like the kidney and the liver. It needs to be washing out all these um, dissonances that are, you know, and integrating them, you know, so that's a metabolism. So I just put it on the table that, um, you know, I know how it is because I live with triggers all the time. You know, I live with triggers all the time. You know, it's hard to explain because, you know, I don't have a ton of addictions. You know, I think my main addiction was probably gambling. I'm not sure I had a real porn addiction. I'm being honest, okay, because I enjoyed it, but I, I didn't find it that hard to give it up. So I don't want to pretend to be more addicted than I am, okay, but I do think I had a gambling addiction, okay, and I think that maybe... I think my NPD itself might be an addictive, and it's similar to an addiction, just because I'm used to arousal patterns, like I'm, like I, I discharge anger or I, I get attitudes towards people, you know, and I sort of fall into letting myself have an attitude about a person as opposed to just letting me feel uncomfortable with a person, you know, and I maybe maybe deep down inside it's like, well, how can I just be uncomfortable with people? Why why don't you try? It? Maybe we should try to be uncomfortable with people without forming an attitude, you know what I mean? And so. Um, now, it hasn't been easy for me, but I do think that, uh, and I'm still working on it, okay? Like, this is not a finished product. Everything I say in these videos is such a rough draft that other people can laugh at me if they see better, you know? Or if those are in the same uh, path that I'm on, they can sort of see the steps that I took and sort of, oh, yeah, I, I was on that stuff one time, or, you know, or they might even be interested in my steps, but then later they get past my step. You know what I mean? Like, they kind of see what I'm saying here, but then maybe six months later, they'll see beyond what I can see. You know what I'm saying? So these are all just like um, rough draft, just kind of just kind of just talking about experience, you know. But like um, I have noticed that um, just kind of I don't know how I did it. Like I, I kind of discovered minimalism and then sort of accidentally I started sort of loading myself with more frustrations just like by instinct. It was almost like instinct took over and it sort of guided me. To just sort of take on a life of a little more frustration and I, I obviously i go through periods where I, I do it better than others you know but like the idea that um that we can sort of um just kind of feel uncomfortable around people without deciding why we're uncomfortable see this is the problem i have with psychology they always want to quickly figure out why do you feel uncomfortable it's like don't be so don't be such a molester you know if you're if you're the therapist don't get into the underpants and try to touch the genitals and ask why just it's enough that someone tells you they feel uncomfortable around people. Oh, you feel uncomfortable around people. Okay. Well, yeah. The, you know, don't even ask so much about it. Okay. You feel uncomfortable. People. Don't try to get an answer. Okay. Because maybe just leaving it unresolved on the table, the heart will take care of it and metabolize it. You see what I mean? Let the dialectic take care of it. You know, it's better to feel uncomfortable around people than to form an attitude about people. Because when you form the attitude about people, you get the relief because now you don't have to have that uneasiness, you know. Or let's say if, if I feel really good, this is so important because I think when we have really good feelings, we don't realize that that's also kind of a disturbance of, of the normal, you know, the normal waves are just like this. But when we feel really good, it's like a tsunami wave, like, whoa. But the problem is a tsunami we know the tsunamis have a, have a downside, you know what I mean? It's like, if I'm riding on the quest, crest of a tsunami, I, I can't be a fool to think it's really so great, even though I feel so great, you know? It's nice to be on top of a tsunami, but it is a tsunami, right? So I think we need to think of it like that. Like, you know, even if I feel really good, that's a disturbance, okay? And we want to make a story about it and make an attitude about it to sort of not just have it just be a disturbance, you know? So like, if I'm feeling really good, it's because, yeah, good things are happening. Like, uh, maybe I should get into that business because I'm feeling so good. Well, maybe that's actually foolish, you know. Maybe you should just let yourself feel good without making a story about it, making an attitude about it, you know. And so it's like even with positive feelings, you know, just letting the feelings, letting the, the frustrations, letting them just be without wrapping them into a story and getting that relief. Because I think when we get into that relief, we're sort of getting into the actual reaction as opposed to just the setup to the reaction, you know, which I believe we can just sort of mostly just let it be without always having to discharge feelings and feelings. So, you know, it's just maybe a little against the orthodoxy of maybe some psychologists, maybe some psychologists would agree with me, you know, but it's just an idea I put out there and wishing everybody the best. I'll talk to you later.